me personally, I think holding on to our history is one of the most important things we have. I would never have seen myself having a job where I'm wearing the full apron, the goggles and the boots and everything, hammering away at metal. That never would have come to mind. I cannot say how important a blacksmith shop like this is because it details the early history of blacksmithing. You can go and visit a welder and those are the more modern one that took over from blacksmithing. But a blacksmith shop from back in the day where you can uh, smell the coal burning. That's an experience like no other, and we have lots of people come in and they're like, wow, look at the smell of that. It's just an incredible thing. It's important to hold on to history and hold on to places that even they're not being used anymore um, to be able to show people what it was like. Um, I mean lots of kids don't understand what a blacksmith shop is to begin with and being able to sh teach them what our history was and, and what their grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents lived and how they lived in their life I think it's that's really important to be able to teach people about history. Hello, my name is Mitchell Marr. I am a summer student currently working at Alberta's oldest operating blacksmith shop. Everything you see from the wood in the walls to the roof that is all original to the structure or as original can be. The shop was built in 1902 by a man named Alfred Jacob Weddle and is actually 116 years old. So as a historical society, we took our best chance to make sure everything stayed as possible. And if you look around the shop, you'll notice we have a lot of older pieces. So actually our second owners of the shop were the Watsons Brothers. They owned the shop from 1903 to 1907. And behind me here, you can see the Watsons Bro sign. Blacksmith shops were super important in Lacombe and across prairie towns all over the province. Um, they were like the one of the most important businesses you could have. We were a very big agricultural center. So it was very important that we had a place that we could fix up farm equipment. So our plows, getting them resharpened, getting our horses, uh, getting horseshoes made and getting our horses shod so that we could use them um, in the fields, our main form of transportation as well. So having a place where we could do all of those things and making nails and all sorts of other little odds and ends was a very, very important part of keeping a prairie town up and running. A lot of the equipment we have here in the shop that we also work with is original to the shop location. So behind me here is a little red. This is actually from another blacksmith in the area, Fred Doberstein, who unfortunately, while fighting in the Second World War on Christmas Day, he lost his arm due to a gunshot wound. So he became the one-armed blacksmith, which means he can't really blacksmith. So it was sold and brought to the shop location here. We then also have Big Bertha, which is to my left here. The reason this is Big Bertha and Little Red is because this is a 25 pounder and this is a 50 pounder. What that means is Big Bertha functions as essentially a 50 pound sledgehammer, while Little Red functions as a 25 pounder. Little Red currently has a bit for stretching metal on it, Big Bertha has a bit for flattening. And they're basically like giant sledgehammers that continually hit the heated metal. You can switch those out and that would be very common to do while you're working with them, but unfortunately we can't have them up and running right now. Due to the belt at the back, it needs to be replaced. We are waiting for funding for that they haven't been working for about three seasons and they're a piece we're asked about a lot. Blacksmithing, I'll say it myself, it's addictive. Hitting the metal, watching it take form from making a leaf. Like even, you're going to see a, like a small piece like this. You can just look at it and think of the possibilities after blacksmithing. Like this could be an S hook, it could be a leaf, it could be a keychain. Anything that you can think of, if you have the skills and creativity, you can make from a piece of metal. So on the horn of the anvil, that's what blacksmiths will commonly use for curling. So if you're doing a smaller piece like an S hook, you'll use the horn. But if you're using a larger curl, like say a piece of circle going around a barrel or anything like that, then you'd end up using the mandrel. So on the outside of a wagon wheel, you would have a metal rim, which getting it with a mandrel wouldn't be as easy in order to get that full curve. So that's why you'd use the bang machine. 
And then over time, as the wheel is used, both the wood dries and shrinks, as well as the metal running over rocks and everything helps to increase its size a little bit. Behind me, you can also see Zach. He is currently a blacksmithing. So he's using our four main tools that are commonly used with blacksmithing. Five, if you want to include the quench bucket. He has the anvil, which as I mentioned is our Czech Austrian style. He has a hammer, to which we have many different weights of hammers, because whenever you're blacksmithing, you don't want, you want to make sure to be moving more with your shoulder than with your elbow and your wrist. Because a carpenter often moves with a wrist and elbow, and that's the surest fire away in order to get tendonitis and that's what we don't want because as a blacksmith you're doing a lot of repetitive work and a lot of repetition and that repetition is what will do your body harm. So whenever we're hammering with a hammer it's more of a full shoulder motion because the shoulder can take it a lot more so that's why you have to deal with different weights of hammer. That's why we have a heavy four pound sledge all the way to very lighter ones that are just measuring the ounces which you basically barely even feel after you use the sledge. We then also have tongs which I think about tongs is we have a whole plethora of them and as a blacksmith, we can change and edit them. So if we find that a pair isn't grasping tight enough, you can literally throw it in the forge, bend it a little bit, change it, and edit it. Interestingly enough, you don't always need to use tongs. It depends on the length of the metal. Like if you have a piece about this long, you'd want to use tongs. Whereas this long, you'd probably just be able to hold it with your hand. Since you're working with metal and all the tools you have are metal, you can change them as you want, as you go to fit your different needs. We then have our forge, which as I mentioned, the wood base is original. And in that we actually burn coal, which we order from Pennsylvania, because we burn a special type, it's called bituminous coal. The coal we get in Alberta here, some of it can be classified as bituminous, but a lot of it also can be classified as anthracite, which is not as great quality coal. That's more stuff you would burn inside your house because it creates less impurities in the air, but more physical impurities, which comes in the form of clinker. Clinker is what gives our forge its personality. It's little metal bits of oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, other kind of chemicals like that, which just cooked out of the coal. And that creates hot spots. It creates warm spots in the fire. We hate it. There's the old proverb that a blacksmith's hell isn't filled with brimstone and uh, fire and brimstone, but it's filled with clinker instead. So. We don't like it. It is really good for flowers though. Wouldn't put it in your vegetable gardens because it will make your vegetables poisonous because of the sulfur content though. Fun fact. So when we actually put coal on it, we never put coal directly on the fire because that will actually snuff out the fire. You have to put it rather in front or in the back and then coat it with some water because the water helps to cool the fire down so that it can cook properly into coke because coke is actually what we're burning. We're not burning the coal directly. Keeping the museum open is really an effort of everybody involved. The Lacoman District Historical Society is a nonprofit organization, so we really rely on people in the community wanting to keep us here. So they have to support us by donating, by coming to the museums, by telling people to come back and visit us, to getting um, grants and donations from the government, federal, local, and um, provincial levels. So it's a really big effort of everyone who loves history and who wants us to be able to interpret history for everyone else that's here. Today I greatly encourage you to come to Lacombe and learn more about our history, not specifically just the history of this building, but of our other historic buildings in downtown and our other museums, and I hope to see you there.